G'day friends, it's Andrew Goodall here again from Nature's Image Photography with now the eighth video in my Photography School series where I break down the settings and skills of manual photography into bite-sized pieces that are easy to understand. For most people who are starting out in photography, this is the big one. It's all about combining aperture and shutter speed using the light meter to guide us to a correct exposure. So all the different pieces we've looked at so far come together in this video. Before we get started, if you're new to the channel, please click that subscribe button so you can keep in touch with more Photography School features, plus content from my entire world of photography. So in previous videos, I've talked about exposure and how we use the light meter to guide us to a correct exposure in manual mode. We've also looked at the two main settings we use to control exposure. Shutter speed controls the duration of the exposure and also affects the sharpness and how we handle a moving subject. Aperture also controls the brightness of the exposure and gives us extra control over depth of field. If you need a recap on any of this, you can revisit some of the earlier videos in the series. Now, here's the important bit. Exposure is not about aperture or shutter speed. It's about aperture and shutter speed combined. So now I'm going to explain how the two pieces fit together. And because this series is all about manual mode, we'll also be looking at how we use the light meter to keep the exposure under control. Let's start with shutter speed. Imagine you're shooting a waterfall and your exposure is correct at a thousandth of a second. Now you want to slow the shutter speed down to an eighth of a second to get that nice soft movement effect. But when you do that, you're going to let in a lot more light. In fact, if you consider that each full stop jump in the shutter speed keeps the shutter open for twice as long, you're now letting in 128 times as much light as you were before. So how do we do this without massively overexposing the second photo? Well, this is where aperture comes in and we can see how the two settings work hand in hand. Because our hypothetical photo was taken at a thousandth of a second with the aperture wide open at f2.8. When we slowed the shutter speed down to an eighth of a second, we let in all that extra light and would have overexposed the image. But if we make the aperture smaller, we can reduce the light. And if we take it all the way down to f32, we've reduced the light by the same number of stops as our change in shutter speed. Now our exposure is exactly the same as when we started, because while the slower shutter speed lets in more light, the smaller aperture lets in less. By using shutter speed and aperture together, we can get the water effect we want and still maintain a correct exposure. In this bit of video, you can see the process in action on the rear screen of my Pentax camera, although the numbers are different because we're dealing in the real world now and not with hypotheticals. On the left you can see the shutter speed and f-stop settings, and on the right is the light meter. I start with the light meter in the middle, but when I slow the shutter speed down it moves to the right, meaning overexposed. Then when I change the f-stop to make the aperture smaller, the light is reduced and the light meter comes back to the middle. I can change the shutter speed by one notch or by a few notches at once. Then I simply turn the aperture dial by the same number of notches and my correct exposure is restored every time. In this video, I'm actually going to take the photos, but first you can see a couple of things have changed. I've turned the camera sideways for a better composition. I've also decided that slightly darker exposures were working out better for this subject. So instead of starting with my light meter in the middle, it's a little to the left. And then each time I slow the shutter speed down a few notches, I adjust the aperture by exactly the same amount to return the light meter to that same position a couple of notches to the left. So once again, I can get the movement effect I want using the shutter speed and balance the light for a correct exposure using the aperture. This lets you experiment. You don't need to know the ideal shutter speed in advance. You can just try out a bunch of settings and decide which one you like later. And because my camera screen doesn't show up so well on the video, here's the last shot in this sequence after a bit of editing from the raw file. Now let's look at this from the point of view of depth of field. With this sequence of macro shots, I started with the aperture wide open at f2.8, and you can see the shutter speed was a 60th of a second. Then for the next few shots, I worked on increasing the depth of field by setting a smaller aperture, which of course means a bigger f-stop because the numbers are all backwards. But the smaller aperture means less light, so you'll notice that as the f-stop number goes up, the shutter speed gets slower. In this way, I can control the depth of field using the aperture and balance the exposure using the shutter speed. So from these two examples, you can see that manual photography is pretty simple. 
in fact a lot easier than you probably expected. Just remember to keep an eye on that light meter. Each time you choose one setting for the type of photo you want to shoot, check your light meter and adjust the other setting to balance the exposure. Whether you're shooting close-ups, sports or portraits, whether you're concentrating on movement or depth of field, understanding the relationship between aperture and shutter speed is the cornerstone of all creative photography. Now let's come back to those numbers so I can really prove to you how beautifully these two settings work together. And please be aware that the way I have lined these numbers up is here just for teaching purposes. I'm not saying that every time you're on f2.8 you have to shoot at a thousandth of a second. The actual pairing of settings will change depending on the light you're shooting in. So this screen is there to demonstrate a principle, not to show you the settings you'll be using in the real world. On the left of the scale, you see that the wider apertures match up with faster shutter speeds. That means when you use a fast shutter speed to eliminate camera shake or to freeze action, you can usually expect to have a shallow depth of field. This is an ideal combination for many different types of photography. It's good for wildlife, where a fast shutter speed will freeze a bit of movement and allow you to use a handheld camera, while the shallow depth of field helps to isolate the subject. The same goes for portraits. It's good for sports, and in fact a multitude of different types of photo can be taken with a fast shutter speed and a wide aperture. Now we go to the other end of the scale, and you can see that slow shutter speeds usually go hand in hand with small apertures. That means if you're going for blurred movement effects, and don't forget your tripod, you can expect to see a lot more depth of field. That's actually a good thing. Getting back to my waterfalls, you can see that the water is blurry because of the slow shutter speed. If you didn't have a strong depth of field, the rest of the photo would be blurry as well. So the only way photos like these work is if we have more depth of field, which is exactly what you get when you combine a slow shutter speed with a small aperture. So after all that, the great news is that putting aperture and shutter speed together is a lot easier than most people realise. Photos that want a fast shutter speed usually benefit from a shallow depth of field, and photos that want a slow shutter speed usually suit a stronger depth of field. So no matter what type of subject you're shooting, each time you choose a shutter speed, you really have no choice but to also choose the aperture that goes with it. But chances are, the aperture you end up with is the one you wanted anyway. Now, if you're one of those rare people who've made it all the way to the end of the video, I have one final point for you. When it comes to combining aperture and shutter speed, there are other options besides shooting in manual or just letting the camera do all the work for you in auto. In shutter priority, you choose the shutter speed and the camera chooses the aperture for you. In aperture priority, you choose the aperture you want and the camera does the rest of the work. This lets you do some of the creative thinking but lets the camera do the heavy lifting. Many people favour these semi-automatic modes because it's easier. The trouble is many people, especially beginners, tend to get a bit too focused on just one setting and forget what the other setting's doing. In manual, you do have to work a little harder, but you're always in total control. And of course, every now and then you strike a difficult subject where manual is really the only way to go. And there's my look at combining aperture and shutter speed. Like I said at the start, this video ties together everything we've done up to this point, and if you can understand all this, you're well on your way to mastering manual photography. Before you go, don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, I have lots more content on the way. I'm Andrew Goodall, this is Nature's Image Photography, thanks for watching.